if indeed our bodies tell God's story, it makes sense why the enemy would attack right here. He wants to blind us to the theology of our bodies. He wants to blind us to the heavenly mysteries that our bodies reveal. That's why he attacks right here. The way we overcome evil, St. Paul tells us, is with good, right? We live in a pornographic culture of death. How do we overcome that culture? Not by just yelling at the bad, not just by uh, throwing that away. Because what is pornography? It is the twisting of something good. Hello and welcome to The Naked Gospel, where we have conversations about sex, singleness, marriage, pornography, and everything in between. We bring on cultural thinkers, parents, important folk, and normal folk alike. I am your host, Shane O'Neill. If you're listening in, video versions of all of these episodes are available at YouTube, uh, Proven Ministries, we have that below. If you're watching, you just rather listen in, then all of these episodes are available on every major podcast platform. Whether you're listening or watching, do subscribe and continue to track with us. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy the episode. Hey folks, thank you for joining us again on The Naked Gospel. Uh, I am pretty excited about this conversation. Uh, Every book that I read by a Protestant on the areas of sexual integrity and... um, I'm just wrestling through the theology. They always reference a guy named Christopher West. Uh, and I've been wanting to talk to him for a while, wanting to have him on this podcast today. He's joining us. Uh, he is the founder and director of the Theology of the Body Institute in Pennsylvania. Do check that out. They have incredible resources. Uh, he's recently written a book. It's called Our Body Tells God's Story. And I think he uh, actually wrote it intentionally for us Protestants, um, if you're a Protestant. And I finished it up recently and uh, loved every bit of it. It helped give me a kind of map that I've been longing for, uh, for a long time. Uh, A lot of people can look at data or statistics or even like uh, biblical narratives, but the way he frames it out, um, I found to be incredibly helpful. It is accessible, it's a small book. So a link to it will be down below if you're interested in checking it out. Um, And as always, if you're interested in supporting this show, check out the Disruptor Initiative. You get a sweet mug and other cool stuff. You get to shape uh, this podcast by suggesting who we have on and the themes that we look at. It's five bucks a month. Um, But pushing that aside, Christopher, thank you so much for being here with us. Jane, I'm so happy to be with you. And I must say what caught my eye initially when when my... uh, someone on my team sent me your request and invitation to be on here was the title of your show, the naked gospel. I was like, yeah, I'm going to be on a show called the naked gospel. Absolutely. Amen, dude. Well, I think the sentiment, you'll appreciate the sentiment because, uh, so when I was going through counseling, uh, it was with, uh, an Anglican priest and at the end of every counseling session, because a lot of it was for my past with pornography and whatnot, and so he had to have this, this cross, this wooden cross with Jesus on it, and Jesus is basically naked, you know, like just true to form, yeah. and he's just mangled. It's not a pretty, pretty representation, uh, but afterwards he'd have, he'd have, he'd stare at it, just stare at it, and then whenever he was ready, he would say, Jesus, make me the man you died to redeem. Mm. And then he would kiss it mm. and then he'd hand it off to me so that, and then I just stare at it and whenever I was ready, I'd utter those words and then kiss him. And then just coming to the realization that the counter image to pornography is a naked man dying on a cross for you, you know, no, yes. no, nothing yes. will sober and humble your heart more than that yes. image right there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And the nakedness of Christ on the cross is theologically of great significance. Because the new Adam relives, uh, and the fancy word in theology would be recapitulates the experiences of the first Adam. Hmm. And we have the experience of the first Adam who was naked without shame. And then the first impact of the original sin is shame in his nakedness. So Christ endures the cross. And we we have to be clear here that 
loincloths were not part of the gruesome spectacle of Roman crucifixion. Yeah. Right. They wanted to humiliate the victim by stripping him. And, and yet we read in scripture that Christ endures the cross heedless of its shame. Amen. Right. So there he is dealing with the shame of Adam. He's Amen. walking right into it, heedless of it. And then on Easter Sunday, that we have this little detail in the gospel that says the grave clothes were left behind. And this is an indication of the new Adam, right, coming out of the ground just as the first Adam had, naked without shame. This is the sign of our redemption. This is the sign that we have truly been restored to the purity of our origins through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and I will add also, also to what you said there, Shane, Christ naked on the cross as the counterpoint to pornography. Let us not forget a, a young Jewish woman who opened her entire humanity to the presence of God and conceived the eternal son of the father. That too is the counterpoint to pornography. Or we could put it the other way around and we could say this, that what the devil is mocking in pornography is precisely the great mystery of the incarnation that took place in the womb of the Virgin Mary and the gift of the bridegroom to the bride that took place on what St. Augustine called the marriage bed of the cross. Mm. Uh, heavy duty concepts, we don't tend to think in these terms but it is, it is so important that we understand this fundamental biblical truth uh, that I've kind of condensed in this way. The devil does not have his own clay. All he can do is take God's clay, which God looked at and said, behold, it is very good. The enemy gets his hands on that clay and twists it, distorts it. Pornography, therefore, is a hellish mockery of a heavenly reality mm -hmm. and the heavenly reality it's mocking is precisely what paul is talking about in ephesians 5 when he says the union of man and woman in one flesh is a great mystery a profound mystery i, I like the ring of the greek uh, the union of man and woman in one flesh is a mega mystery mm -hmm. and it refers to christ and the church whoa 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 time out <laughs> what the sexual union of husband and wife, the, the marital embrace, the intimacy of the joining of man and woman, genital union itself in God's plan is a mega mystery, a great sign that reveals his eternal plan for Christ to be one in the flesh with us. What? What? No wonder the enemy is after it. Why is the enemy after it? Because our bodies proclaim the gospel. They mm. tell God's story. That's why the enemy's after our bodies. Mm. I love all of that. You, you've you got some preacher in you, Christopher West. Yes, I, you do. I do. I'm a proclaimer of good news. <clears throat> I have Amen. beautiful feet. Amen. I have, I have beautiful feet, right? How, how lovely on the mountains mm. Mm. are the feet of him who brings good news. And I, I'm, I just want to proclaim this good news. What good news? St. Paul calls it the redemption of our bodies in Romans chapter 8. We, we think and we kind of talk in terms of Jesus came to save our soul. Uh, but when we hear the word soul in the modern world, we have ruptured that from the body. Uh, if we're trying to live a spiritual life divorced from our bodies, we can make no sense of a God who wed himself to the body. Mm. Right? This is our faith, not a fleeing from the body to reach God. No, no, no. Christianity presents the exact opposite movement. It presents the movement of a God who is pure spirit in himself, but a God who is pure spirit who takes on flesh, hmm. who weds himself to the body to reach us. That means we don't have to flee the body. We're not supposed to flee the body. We're supposed to let Christ meet us right where we are in the body. And he came not only to save our souls, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he came to redeem our bodies. This is our faith. We are saved by the body and blood of Jesus Christ. 
and nothing else saves us. Nothing else saves us. Let's hit. Let's hit because there's a there's this really strong misnomer uh, in a lot of our thinking, and a lot of it's unfortunately intuitive, because we read the word flesh in scripture. And it's it's referring to kind of categorical sin, you yes, know, yes. and and so the the association of the flesh is bad because it's associated with sin, with warpedness, perversion, yes. whatever, uh, it leads a lot of people to thinking quite naturally that the body is bad, and it's replete in the New Testament. You know, it's not just like a proof text. It's like okay, Paul uses this several times. How are we to understand that? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked because it's so important. If we get this wrong, we get the whole story of the gospel wrong. If we get this wrong, we get the whole New Testament wrong. This is why it's so important. So when Paul says live by the spirit, not by the flesh, the spirit leads to life, the flesh leads to death. He's talking in terms that refer in both cases, spirit and flesh, to the whole human being, body, and soul, right? To live by the Spirit is not to reject our bodies. To live by the Spirit is to open our entire humanity, body, and soul, to the indwelling of the Spirit. Conversely, to live by the flesh is referring to the whole human being, body, and soul, who is cut off from the life of the Spirit. And when the body is cut off from the life of the spirit, guess what? Yeah, that leads to death. Your body and my body is going to return to dust because of the fact that we have rejected God's original plan for us. Hmm. We've rejected the spirit. Remember, Genesis says, if you eat from that tree, you will expire. Hmm. What does that mean? It means you will breathe out the spirit I breathed into you. Right? And remember, where is that spirit breathed? It's breathed into the dust of our humanity, the, the matter, the stuff of our humanity. Paul is saying, let your the stuff of your humanity be inspired by the spirit. In fact, he goes on in Romans to say, if the spirit of, who, of God who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then that spirit will give life to your mortal body also, Hmm. right? So this is not spirit good, body bad. Living by the spirit means opening our entire humanity, body and soul to the indwelling of the spirit so that what we do with, as Paul says, will glorify God. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This, he says, is your spiritual worship, right? So we see in Paul's letters the possibility of the body itself being spiritual. This is not the way we think in the modern world, right? We we have inherited uh, the view of angelism from Rene Descartes in the modern world. And here I'm getting a little philosophical. We don't tend to think in these terms, but Rene Descartes gave us the dictum in the modern world, I think, therefore, I am. And that dictum basically makes us think of our humanity as as a conscious thing uh, housed in a body. We end up thinking of, of ourselves as ghosts in a machine. The body becomes something we think about, something we dissect, but it's not who we really are. And we see where this goes. I think, therefore, I am in the modern world has become, I think, therefore, I am whatever I think I am. And we have in the modern world a sense of human identity entirely ruptured from the body. But but think about that for a minute, Shane. What happens when you try to identify some body without reference to his or her body. You identify quite literally no body. And so all this talk about identity in the modern world, and the truth of the matter is we are becoming a culture of no bodies. We have ruptured identity from the body. We have ruptured the body and the soul. And there's a name for that rupture. The the rupture of body and soul has a name. It's called death, 
right? A culture that ruptures the body and the soul is a culture that is killing itself. And that's what we're doing. And a lot of people in the pews of our churches are really walking dead people because we've ruptured the body and the soul. Christianity is the invitation to life and life to the full, which always means it necessitates because of the nature that God has given us. We are not angels trapped in a body. We, we are human beings. We are incarnate spirits. We are this profound marriage of body and soul. That is the biblical view. So life and life to the full in Jesus Christ always means a, a spiritual life that is an incarnational spirituality. It is letting the Holy Spirit dwell in our whole humanity, body, and soul. Life in the spirit that Paul talks about is at one and the same time a redemption of the body so that the spirit and the flesh come together in a profound unity. Indeed, we can, forgive me for going on and on here, but I just want to make this final point. Please. The, the summation of all heresies could be, could be summed up as follows. It's the idea that matter doesn't matter. That's the summation of all heresies. In fact, John tells us in one of his letters, how do we tell the difference between the Holy Spirit and the unholy spirit? We tell the difference because the Holy Spirit affirms the incarnation. The movement of the Holy Spirit is always in the direction of giving flesh to the Spirit, giving flesh to the Word. How do we recognize the unholy spirit? How do we recognize the spirit of the Antichrist. He's the one who denies Christ come in the flesh. He denies the incarnation. So which way are we moving in our spiritual lives? Towards incarnation or excarnation? That determines what spirit we're listening to in our lives. And if we're listening to the Holy Spirit, it's always going to be in the movement of incarnating the spirit, giving flesh to the spirit. The enemy is the one who excarnates, who ruptures the spiritual and the physical, because what does he want? He wants our death, and that's what death is. Mm-hmm. No, that's helpful. That's good. So looking at what we just did was we looked at some of the kind of negative language that would cause us to frame things in a, a misdirection. I want to look at some of the positive language, uh, and then I want you to put some of those pieces together for us. So, sure. so, so we have scripture, uh, it's, it's a marital bookends. I think you use that language in the yeah, book. It starts with a marriage and it ends with a marriage. Uh, and everything in between is framed by that. Um, and you've, I mean, you've got literally an entire book in the old Testament dedicated to love and to eros to the pursuit uh, to a erotic pursuit of one another and it's cool because it it uh it like a good drama it it changes view from the woman to the man and the man to the woman it's beautiful the interplay is beautiful in the new testament something that you find over and over again is that christ is in us and i've always glossed over that and then realizing honestly probably only within the last year that that is that that is penetrating language that that is erotic language uh that that it's it's sexual in nature so you've got these pieces and would you mind just kind of pulling them together adding a few of your own and helping us to see i was talking to someone last night and uh and they they were saying that they don't like romance stories and so i just i was like well you know what kind of genre do you think the bible is and they paused they're like i wouldn't be able to say you know and then that just got into a really great conversation um, because I do, with all my heart, think that it is a romance story. Absolutely. But I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear your thoughts with those pieces. Shane, it, you're absolutely right. From beginning to end, the scripture is a, a romance story. It is. It is God romancing humanity, and in this story, God is the bridegroom, and humanity is the bride. How, how do you understand a story? You have to look at its beginning and its end and its middle. That will give you a good sense of the story. The Bible begins with a wedding in an earthly paradise, right? Throughout the Old Testament, God speaks of his love for his people as the love of a husband for his bride. 
when Israel is unfaithful to Yahweh, the prophets accuse her of committing marital infidelity, right? Skip to the New Testament. The New Testament also begins with the marriage, but this marriage is between humanity and God. Mary, that young woman from Nazareth, is the, the summation of Israel. She is Israel in person. She is the bride Israel. That's who she, she, she sums that up in her person. And she says to the angel, when the angel says, you are going to conceive the son of God, she says, how will this happen? I do not know man. And we can almost hear the echo of the prophet Hosea in the angel Gabriel's response. Hosea says, the Almighty will betroth himself to you, and you will know the Lord. You will know the Lord, right? That biblical word know goes back to Genesis when, when Genesis 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived. This language of, of a biblical knowledge with this connotation of marital union is, a, is the thread that weaves the whole story together. Jesus Christ himself says, this is eternal life, that you would know the one true God. Amen. And that's that same biblical word, Adam knew his wife. So skip to the end of the story. The book of Revelation describes heaven. How? As a wedding. <laughs> Who gets married in eternity? Christ and the church. You will know the Lord. God will betroth himself to you forever, and you will know the Lord. This is eternal life, that you would know the one true God. So look at those two bookends. Begins with the marriage of man and woman in an earthly paradise ends with the marriage of Christ and the church in a heavenly paradise. And when we bring these two bookends together to meet in the middle of the story, where are we? Exactly what you were just saying earlier, Shane. We're at this beautiful, erotic love poetry called the Song of Songs. And the, the saints over the centuries, 2,000 years of Christianity, the saints have written more commentaries on this erotic love poetry in the Old Testament than on any other book in the Bible. More than the Gospels, in fact, more than the letters of Paul, the saints have gravitated towards the Song of Songs, this erotic love poetry. Why? What did the saints understand that we need to get in on? They understood that the whole Bible can be summarized in five words, and here they are. And you know this from, from my book. God wants to marry us. And he wanted this eternal marital plan to be so plain to us that he chiseled an image of it right in the sexual difference. Right? Our bodies tell God's story. What story? That God loves us. He wants to marry us. And there's even more. First comes love then comes marriage, then comes the baby in the baby carriage. What we didn't realize in second grade when we learned that is we're actually reciting some profound theology. It's called the theology of our bodies. Our bodies tell the story that God loves us, he wants to marry us, and he wants the bride to conceive eternal life. I have come so that you might have life and life to the full. This is not just a metaphor. <laughs> right at the start of the New Testament, we have a woman who representing the bride, representing all humanity as the bride, she gives her yes to God's marriage proposal with such fidelity and totality that she literally conceives eternal life in her womb. Pregnant Mary, Mary pregnant with the Son of God, is the icon of what it means to be a Christian. And you pointed this out earlier also, Shane. Christ in us, the hope of glory. What does Jesus say? That I might be in you, and you might be in me, as I am in the Father. That they might be one, Father, as you and I, Father, are one 
from all eternity. Who is the Trinity? From all eternity, the Father is generating the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. God's love is generous. It generates. And this is why God gave us genitals, so we could image his generous, generating love. Right? It's very important to understand, of course, God is not sexual. The generation of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity for all eternity is not a sexual generation. But our sexuality, male and female, he created them, and he blessed them with the power to generate new life. Right? Gender, the very word gender. Uh, oh my gosh, are we confused about this in the modern world? But, but look at the Greek root in gender, the Greek root gen. We see that same root in words like generous, generate, progeny, genealogy, genesis, genes, genetics, genitals. What does it mean? That Greek root means to produce or give birth to, right? Until the modern world started deconstructing the meaning of the word, every Every culture on the planet understood that the word gender means the manner in which you generate new life, and that is determined by your genitals. For men, it's determined by your testicles. For women, it's determined by your ovaries. You need sperm and you need eggs to generate new life. It is impossible, impossible to turn a human being who has testicles, who generates sperm, into a human being who has ovaries, who generates eggs. It's impossible, right? Our gender is determined by our genitals. And God gave us genitals so we could participate in his own generous, generating love. God is not sexual, but our sexuality is an image, a sign, a glimmer, an echo in the created order of the eternal mystery of the Trinity. This is what it means that we're made in the image of God as male and female and in the call to be fruitful and multiply. Amen. This is who we are. Amen. Um, Christopher, so I, I want to get something out of the way and then I want to backtrack a little bit. Yeah. So, so the, uh, I, I would, I hate the idea of somebody who's single listening to this and saying, okay, this is this is just another message about how I'll be a, a full yes. human being once I get married. Yes, you, and, yes. then, and then I'll be able to serve God, but I'm incomplete until then, and the gospel is tethered to marriage, and thus I need to get married yes. to know the gospel fully. Yes. Can yes, you speak yes. into that? Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought it up. It is critical that we understand this rightly. When we fall into that pattern of thinking that unless I get married in this life, I cannot live the fullness of the gospel, or I'm not fully a human being, we have turned the icon of marriage into an idol. Hmm. Let me explain what I mean. Marriage is the number one icon in the Bible of the heavenly reality, right? Two bookends of the Bible. Begins with the marriage of man and woman, but it ends with the marriage of Christ and the church. And remember, this is one of the keys that unlocks the whole mystery for us. Jesus is very clear. He says that in the resurrection, at the end of time, in our ultimate destiny, men and women are no longer given in marriage. Why? Because you no longer need an icon to point you to heaven when you are in heaven. Right? The icon will give way to the ultimate reality. Right, so I have here on my wall, uh, I don't, yeah, you can see it. This is an icon of Jesus Christ in the resurrection, right? I should allow that paint and that wood to point me to Jesus. But if I stop at the paint and the wood itself, the icon becomes an idol. If I worship the wood and the paint itself, the icon becomes an idol. The union of man and woman, more specifically, sexual union throughout all of human history has been the number one idol. Why? Because in the Bible, it's the number one icon. 
when we let the icon do its job, open as a window to heaven, we realize the marriage I really yearn for, the marriage that will truly complete me, the marriage that that alone will satisfy the deepest longing of my heart for love and union. It doesn't come from the first book into the Bible. It comes from the last book into the Bible. This book into the Bible, the marriage of man and woman, is just a little, little, little glimmer, an icon pointing us to the marriage of Christ and the church. Jesus himself says, not all are called to marriage. Some, he says, are called to remain celibate, he says, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, some are called to skip the earthly marriage to devote themselves, even here on planet Earth, to the ultimate marriage. And as a Catholic, I can point to our tradition that recognizes a celibate priest, for example, he marries the church, and we call him father because he's participating in a supernatural realm of fertility, of life-givingness. We also have the tradition in the Catholic Church of a woman religious or a nun who marries Christ, and we call her mother. Why do we call her mother? Because, Like Mother Teresa. Why did we call her Mother Teresa? Because she was married to Christ, and she participated in an entire, entirely supernatural dimension of motherhood. So in a sense, Shane, everyone is called to marriage, but which marriage? Mm. Everyone is called to the marriage of the Lamb. Jesus says, go out into the main streets and invite everyone to the wedding supper of the Lamb, to the wedding feast. So everyone's called to this marriage, the one that ends the Bible. Some are called to this marriage, the one that begins the Bible. When we understand that properly, we understand that remaining single, remaining celibate for the Lord becomes an authentic living out of the vocation of the human being made in the image and likeness of God. We could put it this way. Every man by virtue of being a man, is called in one way or another to be a husband and a father. Every woman, by virtue of being a woman, is called in one way or another, an important qualifier there, yeah. to be a wife and a mother. <clears throat> Every one of us is called to live that out in one way or another, in a way that leads us to the eternal marriage. So, uh, is an implication of what you're saying that even in singleness, your singleness can be an icon? Absolutely. In fact, it becomes an even more potent sign of the kingdom. Hmm. When, now we're not talking about bachelorhood. <laughs> yeah. we're, not, we're not talking about uh, I'm single because I never wanted to get married. Thank God I don't have to wake up with somebody's bad breath. Thank God I don't have to change the diapers. No, 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 that, that's bachelorhood. We're talking about making a sacrifice of the desire to marry for the sake of the greater marriage, right? For, to be a sign, specifically to be a sign here on planet Earth of the ultimate union for which we are destined. Those who live that out according to the invitation of Christ, their whole body... <clears throat> is declaring to the world that heaven is real and it is worth selling everything to possess. And they are proclaiming to the world that there is another dimension of marriage. There is a marriage that lasts forever, that we are made for union with God. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story here that puts this in, in, a, in its proper light, I think. There was a modern um, Carmelite nun a Carmelite nun is a specific tradition of, of a religious sister in the, in the Catholic Church. And she was giving a lecture at a university, a secular university, where she was trying to share her experience as being bride of Christ. And she had some very intimate experiences in her prayer life of just what you were saying earlier, Shane, about Christ in her, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. 
And a secular psychologist came up to her at the end of her talk, and he said this, you are sick. What you really want is sex, but you're confusing your desire for sex with all this ridiculous talk about union with God. And she responded very clearly and firmly and said, oh, no, I beg to differ. What the world really wants is union with God, but it's confusing that desire with all this ridiculous sex. Who do you think was right? Amen. I I love every bit of that. <clears throat> you know, the uh I was I was talking with Peter Kraft, uh who's a, who's a Catholic, and he um I was talking to him and I was asking him to come on the podcast. <clears throat> and he said uh he said no, no, just get somebody like uh like Christopher West onto your podcast. He'll do a much better job than me. <clears throat> I uh I loved that he came on and that we got him on, but uh but he's a hearing good man. So, yeah he is he is he's a he's kind of a rascal he he, he loves rascal, he's yeah. mischief maker yeah he he's is. he's yeah he's the most childlike one of the most childlike men I've ever met honestly um he put me through the ringer that's for sure um but it, it makes sense why he uh why he's learned from you and why he uh he advised getting you on so strongly. I want to back up. I want to. I want to back up. Well, first, uh, simple uh, clarifying points because I, I I'm conscientious of us Protestants having a uh, allergy to the word icon. By icon, uh, in this conversation, we mean sign. We mean window by which we see beautiful things beyond. Yes. Um, and that's yeah. that's how we're we're referring to icon. You know, give me a little education here. Why do why do Protestants have an allergic reaction to the word icon? Because uh, because Protestants think that Jesus died like 500 years ago, and that's when church history started. Um, I think one of my greatest joys uh, as a Christian has been realizing that I have older brothers and older sisters who struggled with the exact same things as me and knew God a lot better who lived a thousand years ago. Wow. You know, finding that out, I mean, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, just all sorts of Bernard of Clairvaux, all sorts of people, and I get to go read their journals, and they struggle with depression, and yeah. they struggle yeah. with anxiety and insecurity, and they wrestled through shame, you know, and yeah. realizing that I have this heritage has been one of the biggest gifts for me as a Christian. That's beautiful, um, Gene. And they struggled yes. with lust. They did, right? they did, yes. Yes. Yeah, there's a, a gnarly story with uh, Aquinas and, and lust and some kind of chastity belt yeah. that an angel placed on him. Um, I, I love every bit of it. It's, 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 it's beautiful and it's good, and it helps me to see my story in the big story uh, and to not feel alone. <clears throat> but yeah. I actually, on this point, want to, want to tell us about, I think I'm saying it right, Carl Wojtyla. Carol, and Carol Wojtyla, yeah. Carol Wojtyla. Uh, just take us through that, because this this was uh, the genesis of things for you. Yes. Um, and talk to us about becoming Pope John Paul II, mm -hmm. and and because uh, he he his methodology was altogether unique and prophetic. Uh, and again, a lot of Protestants have no idea who he is. Yeah, but so Carol, we're Carol starting to catch up. Wojtyla, Carol Wojtyla was uh, born in 1920 in. Poland, and he was, um, he lived through the, the Nazi occupation in Poland as a young man um, in the 40s, and then the Nazis got pushed out by the communists, and he lived under the communist regime for decades in Poland, and he became a priest in his 20s, a Catholic priest, and then he became a bishop at the age of 38, and he was elected Pope John Paul II in 1978 at the age of 58. And one of the first, the first major teaching project of his pontificate as Pope John Paul II was a collection of 129 addresses hmm. that he delivered. The Pope every Wednesday uh, gives a what's called a, the Wednesday Address or the Wednesday Teaching, the Wednesday Catechesis. And John Paul II was the first pope to use that opportunity over months and years to develop a single topic. 
And from 1979 to 1984, a total of 129 Wednesday audience addresses were devoted to a Bible study on why God made us male and female. And he called it the theology of the body. And I didn't discover this until 1993. I was 24 years old at the time, but I remember reading it for the first time, Shane, and it was like I had discovered something as big as the cure for cancer. Hmm. I really felt it was that big. It was the answer to the crisis of our times. The crisis of our times is of a sexual nature. And unless we can demonstrate to the modern world that the traditional Christian vision of human sexuality is not the prudish list of prohibitions that it is so often assumed to be, but rather it is an invitation to the satisfaction of the deepest desires of our hearts. Unless we can demonstrate that, we're not going to climb out of this mess that we're in. John Paul II was a prophet, and not just for Catholics. This was given for all men and women of goodwill to open our eyes to what was really going on in the modern world. What's going on in the modern world? An all-out diabolical attack against the meaning of our creation as male and female in the image and likeness of God. Why is the enemy after this? Well, think about it. If, as St. Paul says, the union of man and woman is a mega mystery that reveals God's eternal plan to marry us, that reveals the mystery of Christ's love for the church, if indeed our bodies tell God's story, it makes sense why the enemy would attack right here. He wants to blind us to the theology of our bodies. He wants to blind us to the heavenly mysteries that our bodies reveal. That's why he attacks right here. The way we overcome evil, St. Paul tells us, is with good, right? We live in a pornographic <clears throat> culture of death. How do we overcome that culture? Not by just yelling at the bad, not just by uh, throwing that away, because what is pornography? It is the twisting of something good. Can I give a visual here? Yeah, please. All right. Here's my visual. I use this all the time. I, I want you to imagine that this is the most beautiful painting you've ever seen in your life. What, I what is it? What's the most beautiful thing God has created? This is a painting of man and woman, just as God made us to be, naked without shame. There's nothing more beautiful than the call of man and woman to become one flesh written right into their naked bodies. That's how God made us to be. This is, to use that word again, the biblical word is image, and another translation of the word image is icon, right? This is an image of God. This is an icon of the divine life, and that's why the enemy's after it. He aims all his diabolical hatred at this painting. And here's what happened to the painting with the original sin. It became terribly twisted up and distorted, right? And here's the classic mistake of spiritually minded people. I put that in quotes. Spiritually minded people look at this painting in its crumpled up form. And what does it look like? Modern art. It looks like trash. It looks like trash. Yeah. So what do we think the solution is? Throw it away. And we grow up in so-called Christian homes thinking spirit good, body bad. This is not our faith, right? That is Puritanism. That is Gnosticism. That is Manichaeism. That is Jansenism. All heresies condemned repeatedly, repeatedly by the church. But let's go to, I'm going to bring, bring us back here to, to who Carol Wojtyla is. But first I have to talk about Hugh Hefner, one of his contemporaries. Hugh Hefner, in 1953, starts Playboy magazine, and he says, I started Playboy magazine as my personal response to the hurt and hypocrisy of Puritanism in my strict Christian upbringing. Wow. Hugh Hefner reaches into this trash can 
and start saying to the modern world, you mustn't throw this away. And I say, was Hugh Hefner right to tell the modern world we shouldn't throw this away? Guess what? On this point, he was right. We shouldn't throw this away. But where was he wrong? And wrong in such a way that it has led to the horrific culture of pornographic lust and death that we're living in today. Where did he get it wrong? He left the painting just like this in its crumpled up form. And he started saying to the modern world, don't you want to look at this? Don't you want to look at this? And because here's another metaphor I like to use, because fast food is better than starving to death. We were like, yeah, I'm hungry. Give me some of that. Right. I, I like to call the what's going on in the world today. I call it the fast food gospel. It's the promise of immediate gratification of erotic desire. I was raised in the 70s and 80s on what you might call the starvation diet gospel, which is that throw it away, it's bad, it's dirty, it's evil, right? Well, here's some good news. Right at the same time Hugh Hefner was starting Playboy magazine, a young Polish priest named Karol Wojtyła also pulled this out of the trash can and started saying to the modern world, you mustn't throw this away. But he did something Hugh Hefner didn't do. By reflecting deeply on Christ's words about God's plan for man and woman in the beginning, and by reflecting deeply on the power of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to redeem <clears throat> our bodies, this young Polish priest started uncrumpling the painting for us so that we could see once again who we really are as men and women made in the image and likeness of God, so that we could restore the true image of God in our humanity as male and female. This is the good news that we have to share with the world, right? The world is celebrating this right now, and a lot of Christians are throwing it away. No, no, no. This is what we have to celebrate. But the only way we can celebrate it is if we uncrumple it. And the only way we can uncrumple it is if we die with Christ in order to live with Christ. Right? This is our faith. We carry in our bodies, St. Paul says, the death of the Lord. Why? So that the resurrected life of the Lord might also be manifested in our bodies. <laughs> Amen. This is the uncrumpling of the painting. This is our faith. It's called redemption. It's also called Christianity. Mm -hmm. Go out into the main streets and invite everyone to the feast. Christianity is not a starvation diet. It's an invitation to a wedding feast. Mm -hmm. I find that when I'm when I'm listening to you, my my head splinters with questions in wonderful ways. It's very stimulating, um, and I just arbitrarily pick a direction. Yeah, ask away. Um, yes, yes. So I I was curious about let's let's start looking at some some application as you've taken us there with you, Hefner. Um, so you mentioned earlier that every every heresy is is you know, founded upon um, diminishing the body in some way, in some if not way, out, could, outright say, disregarding it. Yeah. In so, some, let's, let, me, let me put it this way. In some way, every heresy is an attack against the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity. Hmm. That's what the devil's after. That's what he's after. So I'm curious. I don't know if you would view like a secular ideology as heresy per se. I could, I could, it seems like it'd be easy to make the argument that that would be the case, yeah, but I'm yes. I'm thinking particularly of like naturalism, which elevates so high, as they say, the the physical reality. And they say the physical reality is all that exists, um, and they place this this premium of value on the physical, even as they deny that objective value exists, which is is, is interesting. Um, and again, there there are certain weird oxymoronic realities there of like kind of a post-humanism of looking. I mean, we, I 
I my job necessitates in a lot of ways that I live disembodied because I'm living in a lot of virtual worlds. Yes. And so learning how to be embodied when when it's a technologically telecommunicated uh, world uh, and scene that I find myself in is an ongoing journey. Yes. But when it comes to just naturalism in particular, and then you can look at, I, I would love for you to look also at postmodernism where there's this kind of disregard for the body, but then yes. people changing their bodies yeah, to oh. fit what they sense inside. So looking at these two, I'd, I'd love your, your thoughts. If you could apply sure. theology of the body in these directions. Shane, I, I love that your mind went to those places. It shows your intuitiveness and it shows that you're tracking very well with what with what I'm presenting here. Hmm. Uh, let's look at, at what I would call the first lap of the sexual revolution. And then I would call it the last lap of the sexual revolution. The first lap of the sexual revolution was a false elevation of the body. And I would even call it an idolization of the body, where we we raise the body to, to a level of idol, and we start worshiping sex as if it could satisfy our union for the infinite, right? That's what the sexual revolution was founded on. The sexual revolution was saying, hey, Hey, come over here. Here's what you want. Here's what you're looking for. This will satisfy that hunger you feel. And, and for me, let's go back to that metaphor of the starvation approach, the fast food approach, and the banquet approach. If you don't know anything about the banquet, which is Christianity, and the only two choices are starvation or fast food, I don't know about you, but I'm hungry. I'm yeah. going for the chicken nuggets, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and don't lie to me those chicken nuggets taste really good going down. Yeah. And even if you've been told your whole life, don't go to the fast food, it's, it's not good for you. You don't, you don't give a flying beepity beep when you're hungry, right? You are going to those chicken nuggets and they taste good going down. Yeah. Why do we go to sin? Sin always provides some semblance of satisfaction of our deepest desire a semblance. That's why we go there. But if fast food becomes your steady diet, how are you going to feel? In my college years, the grease and the sodium, so to speak, caught up with me. And I was in a very bad state. This is the late 1980s for me. And it was that pain that compelled me to ask bigger questions and say, there's got to be more to life than this. And it started my search, and it's how I discovered this Bible study called The Theology of the Body and discovered that Christianity is not a starvation diet. It's an invitation to a banquet. That began the long journey, and I'm still on it 30 years later. That began the long journey for me of, of healing from my idolatry. And part of that healing is also to recognize the flip side of idolatry. When we don't know about the banquet, when we don't know there is an infinite satisfaction for eros, we are bound as individuals and as a culture to flip-flop between idolizing and despising the body. Hmm. Idolizing and despising the body. We just go back and forth. Why? We eventually despise whatever we idolize because the idol can never do what we invest in it to do for us. That's good. It can never satisfy our yearning for the infinite. Yeah. That's what Eros is. Eros is a yearning for the infinite. And when we take our yearning for infinite joy and aim it at finite pleasure, we have an idol. And when we finally realize that our idol could not satisfy our yearning for infinite joy, we begin to despise the thing we idolized. That is what I'm calling the last lap of the sexual revolution. And we're already on it. The mm -hmm. culture now is despising the human body. The culture is despising the sexual difference. The culture is, what is a man who chops off his penis, not because he has cancer, but because he hates his penis, what is he doing other than despising his body? What is a woman who chops off her breasts 
uh, doing. It's not because she has cancer. It's because she hates her breasts. This is the indication that we are in the last lap of the sexual revolution because we are despising what we idolized. Here's the good news. Despise and idolize are not the only option. Christianity is an invitation to divinize the body. Not that we divinize it, but that Christ himself divinizes the body. What does that mean? Peter tells us in one of his letters that we are called to participate in the divine nature. Yeah. How does that happen? By becoming one flesh with Jesus Christ, right? Christ in me, the hope of glory. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. That's like Jesus saying, unless the bride be in union with the bridegroom, she cannot conceive, right? Christianity is an invitation to a marriage, the marriage of Christ and the church. And that marriage is consummated in what traditions, what tr Christians have traditionally called Holy Communion, right? When the bridegroom says to the bride, this is my body given up for you and the bride receives the body of the bridegroom and now christ in her is the hope of glory right this this is the divinization of the body not the idolization not the despising the divinizing of the body and it happens in what Trist christians traditionally call the liturgy Right? The liturgy is where what Christ did on the cross reaches our bodies. Right? So what are our choices? Here are our choices with eros and sex. Idolize, despise, or liturgize. And what, does, what happens when we liturgize? We divinize. Or God divinizes us. How often is Christianity accused of demonizing the body? No, 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 no. Demons demonize the body. Christian, Christianity, Christ himself, divinizes the body, raises the body up to participation in the eternal exchange of the Trinity. Hmm. We believe right now that Christ's body, right now, is participating in the eternal ecstasy of the Trinitarian exchange. And shame, this is the destiny of your body, my brother. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait to see your body divinized, participating in the eternal exchange of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And this is why the demons are after our bodies. The Satan fell out of envy, the scripture says. What does he envy? What do we have that the angels don't have? Lucifer was the greatest angel God ever created, but he, we have something he doesn't have. What do we have that he doesn't have? Bodies. And guess what we get to do that even the angels don't, can't possibly do? Participate bodily in the eternal ecstasy of the Trinity. Lucifer fell out of envy. He envies that we have bodies. And envy is not only jealousy, right? Jealousy says, I wish I had what you have. But envy goes a step further and says, I hate that you have it, and I want you to hate that you have it. Look how successful Lucifer has been in getting us to hate our bodies. And sometimes even Christians hate their bodies in the name of what they think is holiness, because we think Christianity is throwing this away. No, 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 no. Christianity is letting Christ into our brokenness, into our shameful places, into all the lies we believed about our humanity so that our entire humanity, soul and body, can be fully redeemed. This is our faith. This is what theology of the body proclaims to the world. And, and this is what I discovered when I first read Carol Wojtyla's work, and I really believed I discovered the cure for cancer, and I knew then I was 24, I'm 52 now, I knew then I'd spend the rest of my life studying this and sharing it with the world. This mm -hmm. is...
This is the crisis of our times, and this is the antidote to it. Amen. I want to I want to do a, a recap because you uh, you offer this in the book in the beginning. So help help me with this. So let's see because because humans are made in the image of God, male and female, and because marriage is a representation of Christ's relationship with the church. Let's see. Gender, sex, and marriage. How we understand gender, sex, and marriage has a direct uh, impact on how we understand God, Christ, and the church. Is Amen. that how? That's the logic of it, yep. right? Yep, absolutely. And then you take us, and the journey of your book is taking us from literally me as an individual to the Trinity. Let's see if I can pull this one out. So uh, the D- distinctiveness of me helps me to see uh, how I I have a difference from another, so yes. male and female. Yes. Yes. And then the joining of male and female um, is the the icon representation of the mystery of Christ's relationship with the church. And Christ's yes. relationship with the church uh, takes us then to the Trinity and the uh, the the beautiful, again, we use the language, erotic relationship thereof of God, how God is we won't say community, but like a community. I remember uh, Pope John Paul II had something, communion, what was it? The Trinity is a communion of persons. Yes, yes, I loved that. Can I just add this one qualifier? Because I know when people hear the word erotic, I know how I used to hear that word. We hear the word er eros or erotic, and we confuse it with another Greek word, porneia. Yeah, that's good. Eros is not porneia. Porneia is this the crumpled crumpling up of eros porneia is a twisting uh an adulterating of eros right when when we use the word eros in the biblical sense we have to realize we're talking about this uncrumpled reality we're talking about what god intended in the beginning when they were naked and felt no shame and eros in the beginning john paul ii tells us using another Greek word, he says, eros expressed agape. Hmm. Uh, Agape is divine sacrificial love. Eros expressed agape. Sin comes into the world precisely because eros gets separated from agape. Or or to use a a, a biblical image, we run out of wine. Hmm. Wine in the scripture is a symbol of that divine love poured out. So this shines a whole new light on the miracle of the wedding feast of Cana. Hmm. That married couple runs out of wine. John Paul II tells us that's a symbol of the original sin. We've all run out of wine. But here's the good news. Christ restores the wine to the wedding in superabundance. If you do the math, it's like over 700 bottles of wine that Jesus brought to this wedding. Hmm. Where do we get the idea that Jesus is a party pooper? Yeah. Right? The goal of the Christian life from this perspective is to get totally schnookered, totally sloshed, totally drunk on God's love. Hmm. What did they accuse the apostles of on Pentecost day when the love of God fell on them? They said, Being you drunk. guys are drunk. Christ came to restore agape to Eros. That's what the gospel is, and and that's what you're unfolding. So forgive me. I just wanted to throw that in. There. No, all of that is good. Um, so I, I I've I've heard you say before. Um, so if I'm saying it wrong, correct it. And I'd love for you to speak into this just as we wind down. This will be the last question, but um, wedding feast of the lamb. I think so. We all know like experientially, like we know it in our gut with the starvation diet of like, okay, just wait, just wait, just wait. And, and having kind of a a negative sexual ethic, you know? Um, And then the kind of fast food diet of consume whatever you want, whenever you want it. And most of us know the emptiness of that. Like when you watch porn and ejaculate, you're so sober afterwards. So sober. Um, So we know experientially, like we know in our gut, in our viscera, those two ways of eating help us help help us to understand how to identify our gut cravings uh, for the the wedding feast of the lamb. Yes, yes. 
I'm going to quote here from an Eastern Orthodox theologian named Timothy Petitsis. Hmm. He says it very well. The way you overcome bad eros is with good eros and plenty of it. Hmm. The goal of the Christian life, he says, and I couldn't be in, in more agreement. The goal of the Christian life is to become an all-consuming eros for the living God. The fathers of the church tell us that prayer is nothing other than becoming a longing for God. Let's just walk right into that temptation to click on internet porn and indulge in the fast food and masturbate, all right? Sin is misdirected eros here. Yeah. Right? It doesn't mean Eros itself is bad, but you're taking it to the wrong place. Eros, at its deepest level, is our desire for union with God. So what do you do when that temptation comes? Most people think there are only two options, indulge or repress. Yeah. Right? I'm not going to think about that. 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 If that's your approach then you're just trying to suffocate arrows. That's the starvation approach, right? How do we overcome bad arrows with good arrows and plenty of it? Here's another approach. Not, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that. How about this? Lord, thank you. I praise you for the goodness and beauty of the human body. I praise you and I thank you that the human body awakens in me a hunger that I cannot satisfy. I trust in faith that you desire to fulfill my yearning for infinite joy. And I open to you my every longing. Mm -hmm. I open to you my every desire. I open to you this twisted lustful thing in me. And I ask you, please, by the power of your death and resurrection to untwist in me what sin has twisted so that I might experience this redemption, so that I might be uncrumpled in my humanity, so that my yearning might be directed towards the infinite joy for which I am made. Hmm. What I'm describing here is nothing other than Christian prayer. Hmm. This must become our prayer, opening our desire for the infinite toward the infinite, and in the process, renouncing all of our God substitutes, mm -hmm. renouncing our false infinities. Pornography is a false infinity. It is a God substitute. We are looking to participate in the eternal ecstasy of the Trinity, and we are selling our birthright for a bunch of pixels on a screen that are mocking di diabolically the truth of marriage, which is a sign of the eternal exchange of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So we are how many steps removed from the reality? Not only are we substituting something beautiful, the mar I mean, marriage can become an icon, right? But marriage in itself is still something good. We are going even deeper into the dysfunction, and we are substituting a diabolic mockery of the icon for the reality. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's diabolic at so many levels. And by diabolic, I mean the end goal of the devil is the rupture of the marriage of Christ in the church. That's his end yeah. game. That's yeah. diaboline, rupture. The very word diaboline in Greek means to rupture, to fracture, to divorce, to break apart. Hmm. The word symboline, from which we get the word symbol, means to bring together, to unite, to marry. Hmm. So marriage is a symbol. It is meant to bring together the mystery of God with the mystery of our humanity. Pornography ruptures it. It's a break, and it blinds us to the story that our bodies really tell hmm. yeah i uh i've liked paul's language there in romans 8 uh the spirit groans for us with utterances too deep for us 
Um, but that's- at the same time, and then he talks about creation groaning. Yes. And I, I've liked that's been helpful for me to know that, like, uh, start framing prayer as groaning in Brody. the right direction. Shane, and you're right on it, brother. You're and right sin on- in, a long t- in a lot of ways just groaning in the wrong direction. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We have to stay in the ache yeah. and groan with all of creation for the coming of the bridegroom, mm-hmm. right? What the, the very first words in scripture spoken by a human being are the words of the bridegroom, Adam, mm-hmm. rejoicing in the naked beauty of his bride. Mm-hmm. And the final human words spoken in scripture in the book of Revelation are the words of the bride groaning in the spirit for the coming of the bridegroom. Mm. This is the whole of scripture, right? Mm. Summarized, the bridegroom yearning for the bride and the bride yearning for the coming of the bridegroom. Mm. That's the key that unlocks the mystery. That's the key that will take us into the depths of knowledge of God. This is eternal life, that you would know God. And this is why the enemy is hell bent on blinding us to this key of knowledge, right? And it's often a blinding in the name of righteousness. Think of what Jesus said to the Pharisees. You hide the key of knowledge. You Mm. yourselves do not want to enter the mystery, and you prevent others who are trying to enter from entering. You won't even use the key. You've Mm. thrown it away. Yeah. Whereas the pornographic culture is so mesmerized by the key, we fixate it on the key to the point that we don't even recognize it as a key that's going to open up something else for us. We've mm. just fixated on the beauty of the key. Mm. And the, be- the key is beautiful, but the key is meant to be used to open up to us the wine cellar of the Song of Songs, which takes us into union with God. Amen. This is our faith. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I love that. Uh, and we're, we, we do, we're going to stop there because it's a beautiful place to stop. And we've been crushing time. Um, so we always end, Christopher, with two questions. One, how can people be tracking with what you're doing? And two, uh, how can we be praying for you? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate those two questions. When you say tracking with what I'm doing, like uh, follow Tell what us doing, about stay in touch. Yeah, follow what you're doing. Tell us yeah. a little bit about the theology, uh, theology of the Body Institute. Sure. So I am the president of a theological institute where, devoted to sharing this vision with the world. And one of the main things we do is offer courses here at a beautiful retreat center in Pennsylvania. They're five day intensives, hmm. and uh, you can also take them online. Um, but I always recommend if you're able, come in person. It's much more powerful. I mean, it's theology of the body after all, right? It's good to be body, bodies. <laughs> yes. So I, I'd invite people to go to theologyofthebody.com. That'll take you to our main website. Look at our course schedule, both online and in person. We have, uh, I mean, you can take them just for enrichment. We've had over 7,000 people from around the world travel here just to take these courses for enrichment. We have about 300 or 400 people enrolled in our certification program. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have another 100 or so uh, enrolled in our master's degree program. So if you Mm -hmm. want to go the distance into this vision, that would be something. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, community of patrons from around the world that um, are part of a community where we offer exclusive ongoing formation in the theology of the body to our patrons. You can look at that by going to theologythebody.com as well, and you'll see all the books that I've written there. Hmm. And uh, you can go to our YouTube channel, Theology hmm. of the Body Institute uh, YouTube channel, and you'll see tons of videos there from me and from other people on our staff. Um, yeah, just start diving in. Google Theology of the Body and just start reading. Um, I'd, I'd recommend as a good entry point this book for Protestants that I wrote, Our Bodies Tell God's Story. It's a great entry point. If you're Catholic, I'd recommend the book I wrote called Theology of the Body for Beginners, which was specifically for a Catholic audience. So that's that's mm. a good place to start, all those things. Mm. Um, in terms of how you can pray for me, I noticed even earlier as I was talking about, you know, this is my mission and I want to go out and change the world. I, I can sometimes I can sometimes get off a, a, a place of humility where where I'm like gung-ho, like change the world and and I started 
work 30 years ago. I, I came out there with guns blazing. And man, I, I learned the hard way that uh, self-reliance gets you nowhere in proclaiming the gospel message. And I can relate, who can't? I can relate so much to Peter, you know, at the Last Supper. I'll die for you, Jesus, whatever. I'll, I'll go wherever I have to go. Peter, you have no idea. In Just tonight, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. You don't even know. And yet, eventually, Peter did die for the Lord. So what was that transformation that took place between the Last Supper when it was kind of just self-reliant bravado and a real humility, recognizing his weakness, that allowed his weakness to be a channel of the Lord. So my, my request in all of that is to say, please pray for me that I would stay in my weakness, mm. that I would stay in a place of humble acceptance of my broken humanity, which when that is open to the Lord is no obstacle to the Lord working through it. If I go out there flexing my own muscles or something, I'm just gonna be taken out by the enemy. And I've seen many times I've been very close, like this close to having the enemy take me out because I've relied on myself rather than on the Lord. Hmm. So again, just please pray that I would forever rely on the Lord and that I would decrease so that he can increase. Amen. Bless you, Christopher. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, I think we've all probably been encouraged and challenged by your zeal. Um, it's it's clear that you have a great deal of affection for him. Uh, and we love God because he first loved us, Amen. which means so it means that you are aware of the affection that he has for you. Uh, and I, I find that to be quite contagious. So thank you for being with us, uh, not just to share your knowledge, but also to share uh, your uh, the affection that you and Jesus have with one another before us. Thanks, Shane. I, I appreciate it. I feel seen and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And that's a sign mm -hmm. of the knowledge of the Lord's affection for you as well. It you really know. is. As we let the Lord's love in more and more, we come to see one another more yeah. and more. And that it, is true. It's beautiful to see you, my brother. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you again for being with us. You're so welcome. Oh, folks, that was uh, awesome. That was awesome. I felt like a kind of a kid playing uh, in a fire hydrant. Uh, that was busted open in the summer and just just playing and dancing and uh, mixing it up. So it was just a lot of fun. Uh, but the fire hydrant was definitely there. And I, I have no way of distilling this conversation other than to say um, there's this myth that sexual integrity is like kind of a, a, a one fix. You know, once you stopped watching porn, then you're fine. You can move on to other spiritual formations. And I just it's just not true. Um, I've got distance from pornography, but I'm still learning how to love my wife and be safe for my sisters and, and to see other human beings as brothers and sisters and learning how to be embodied, that my body isn't just biological, but that it is theological. There are a lot of demands upon me and learning how to use my body to show real affection and to show real care that is safe and true. Uh, my soul longs for that. So that's the only way I have to sum up this conversation. I think Christopher is giving us a lot of resources to be able to live properly human. And I'm excited to continue to excavate them, try and twist his arm in the future to get him back on. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you found this conversation helpful, share it with someone else that you think would benefit from it. We're grateful for all of you. Thank you for joining us on The Naked Gospel. Catch you next time. Bye.